When a person first enlists in the military, regardless of the branch of service, the first set of orders that person receives is to go to boot camp or basic training. The main goal for this training is to break the civilian mentality and make a soldier out of you. Through the years, this program has been tailored so brilliantly. It is designed to get into the deepest brain cell and tattoo the military mentality, culture in the brain of the recruit. Upon completion of the program, the person is ready to join the armed forces, to proudly wear the uniform and represent whatever branch of service he or she might have joined. Most importantly, the person is ready to carry out the orders given by those in the chain of command and execute them without hesitation. Growing up in a Catholic family at an early age, I knew that serving the Lord in the priesthood was my calling. I became a seminarian and through prayers, meditations and a life in a monastery, I grew up in my faith. Serving my community was a way to profess my religion. Later on, I got out of the seminary and continued to serve my community through the youth groups at my local church. Subsequently, a few years later, I got married and then September 11 happened. Somehow, witnessing those twin towers collapse and innocent American people dying affected me so deeply. I felt that I had to do something and after discussing it with my wife, I decided to enlist in the Navy. I found myself attached to a highly deployable tactical unit. Very soon, I was headed to the Middle East in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. My civilian self along with my family and my wife, were left behind that door at home. This was the moment I, I have signed up for, the moment where the military overpowered the spiritual person. We landed in the Middle East at an undisclosed remote location. It was a pitch dark night. As the plane dimmed off the lights, we were instructed to suit up in full gear, to form a single line and remain in absolute silence. As the ramp of the airplane touched the ground, we were instructed to quickly disembark and board a nearby bus. I couldn't help to notice the heavily armed military personnel guarding these buses. Once inside, I saw all of the windows covered with curtains and I also noticed a deathly silence. No one was saying a word. Once the convoy got on the way and the helicopters began to fly around us along with the tanks that were blocking each intersection, I then realized this was no seminary-like environment. This was war and fear was not an option. I said a prayer in my head and I asked God to allow me to go back home, but not in a wooden box. The same way I witnessed those twin towers collapse to the ground on September 11, deep down in that moment, I knew this experience was going to tear me apart and was going to test me to my core. The mission for my Navy unit was to protect aircraft carriers upon entering the much anticipated mysticism and dangers of the Persian Gulf. Once we took charge of their protection, we became watchdogs. During my first mission, when the captain's voice came through the radio and said to us, United States Navy patrol boat, this is Captain so-and-so. From this moment, my life and the lives of 3,000 sailors are on your shoulders. Please take us safely to our final destination. Suddenly, 
our senses became extremely acute and anything that moved on air above and below the water became a threat. All I knew was that we had a mission to fulfill. Even if the last resource after we have exhausted and used all of the weapons we had on board meant that we will crash our high-speed boat onto the threat, we were willing to pay the ultimate price. One way or the other, the threat had to be neutralized right away. To put it into context, we knew when we will go out, but not if or how we will come back to shore. I think it is safe to say that we were hyper-vigilant, guarded 24-7, emotionally numbed. My survival mode was not to rationalize on anything, to never question the mission, its purpose, to numb my feelings, my emotions, to toughen up and get the job done despite of my convictions. Although I could go on and tell you multiple stories and situations that happened while in country, I would like to bring your attention to the emotional state of mind in which we all had to endure on a day-to-day -day basis. For some, their coping mechanism was to work out, binge eating, focusing on work, listening to music, the point is that we all organically came up with a strategy to make the best out of our own experience. When the time came up to pack up and head back home, I realized the emotional excess baggage I was flying home with. My plan was, during the flight back home, to once and for all simply turn off the hypervigilant and guarded mode since it was no longer needed. However, that proved to be a rather complex task. At least for me it was. I had no clue on how to do that. As we landed at the Coronado Naval Base, all I remember was breathing heavily with anticipation, as if all these emotions I have been suppressing for so long, they just suddenly wanted to wake up and they were waking up and they wanted to come out. In my head, everything became foggy. I wasn't able to manage or contain my anxiety, the anticipation, an overwhelming feeling of being back home. All I remember was shaking hands with high-ranking personnel as I got off the plane. To compose and remain guarded or simply surrender myself to the emotions that kept coming up for me was a question being repeated over and over in my head. I found these feelings to be scary, but yet I was craving them so much being embraced by my entire family never felt so good. The fact that we were on national television while we were trying to figure out what was happening proved to be too much at the time. It felt as if it was a dream, but it was very real. All I know is that I was not mentally prepared for that emotional tsunami that took over me. As I stood in front of the threshold on my front door at home, I hoped to reconnect with the civilian self, with my wife, the family I had left behind that door, feel whole once again. Unfortunately, that didn't work that way for me. I don't know if it was the fact that I was older when I joined the military, or if this was the case for every veteran trying to come home. The average person, it's about 18 years old when he or she signs up for the military. 
If they go straight into active duty, they will serve a four-year term. This will put them right into 22 years of age. At such a young age, this, person's, this person had become institutionalized with the military culture. It is what they know, what gives them a sense of belonging to something bigger than them. It gives them an identity. As you go through your military experience and endure multiple situations at such a young age, how is this person to digest and reintegrate into society in which he or she has never taken part in it to begin with? Remember, going into the military, there is basic training or boot camp that will teach them the ins and outs of the military. However, there is absolutely nothing that will allow this veteran to safely manage the transition into unknown territory. Not to mention, this, person, this person's brain hasn't even finished developing. The moment I stripped out of my medals, my uniform, and I stood naked in front of my mirror, I didn't even recognize the person I was stare, that it was staring back at me. The perception that I had that I was going to merge with the civilian person I've left behind became evident that it was going to be almost an impossible task. And one end of the spectrum, the military was overtaken by all these emotions and experiences that were collected while in service. Emotions that, because they have been suppressed for so long, they were trying to come out. On the other side, there was the spiritual person that once had professed God as the center of his life, questioning the fact that I have replaced my beliefs with the orders of those in the chain of command. How was I to make sense of all this and reconcile this ambiguity within myself. In my quest to find answers, I went to the VA, trying to speak with someone. I was prescribed antidepressants and instructed to go home and if within a month or two I wasn't feeling better, to come back and they will double the dosage. I needed to speak with someone someone that will hear what had been stored inside for so long and now was trying to come out. I was having an existential crisis. I needed to be heard, not given meds to numb the pain once again. I found it impossible to open up to my ex-wife, my parents, my friends. Anxiety kicked in along with anger and a sense of being lost. Everyone around me, including the doctors, were quickly diagnosing me, diagnosing me with PTSD. The lack of knowledge from my peers and my community on how to support me created this deadly silence once again. The only difference is that this time I could hear them whispering about me behind my back. Currently, statistics show 22 veterans commit suicide on a daily basis. We must help them find their way home before meds, alcohol, or drugs will find them. I would like to invite each and every one of you to educate yourself on how to be there for returning veterans. What can you do as a society to welcome them and embrace them truly with all their baggage? How can we make them feel safe? We must be able to reciprocate with the same safety they were fighting for us to have here at home. I can guarantee you, in the majority of the cases, it is not with meds, silence, or the ambivalence, about, the ambivalence about the nature of our society. It is with love 
and patience. We must engage with them and allow them to become part of our society. As a society, they have yet to experience as an adult. Thank you.